y'all guess what we're doing today let me introduce myself first my name is Allie I am a five-year a little over five-year hospice nurse if you haven't been to my channel before wondering why I have such an obnoxious shade of lipstick on it was because I was filming something else on Instagram don't mind this I would never wear this to work so what are we doing today we are going to do an overview of a typical hospice nurse's visit. It's not going to be perfect because A, I don't have a patient. Um, it's not real life. It's kind of hard to do. So I'm just going to try to um, run through the basics with y'all. Uh, I'm not going to be using too much of my real stuff. Obviously, it's quarantined <laughs> because of uh, the COVID. Is that my teeth? Ugh. I'm going to be using what I can and I'm going to just do my best for you guys and show you kind of how a typical visit goes from start to end um, and some of the main things that we do on our visit. Um, it might be a little bit talky. Do my best, like I said. So let's get started. The first thing, first things first, I'll eat your brain. The first thing that I do, obviously I'm in my car, every nurse or home health hospice nurse, we're going to start off our visit in our car. The thing you're going to do is you're going to call your family member to set up the visit, family member or patient. I like to review if they have any questions or concerns before I head out. Sorry about the shaking. If they have any questions or concerns, that way I can be prepared when I get there. And then I will also um, kind of breeze through the chart. Keep in mind that I do primarily weekends. A lot of the patients I've been seeing for the first time going in for like a PRN issue or some sort of focus visit usually. I always do a, a full head to toe on each of my visits because it gives a more thorough exam even if I'm going in there just for one thing. You're going to call your family member or patient, set up the visit, and then I like to review if they have any questions or concerns before I go there. Usually in the chart, it will show the reason for my visit since I do mostly PRN visits. And then I will, of course, set up the time and review parking. Even if it's a rural area, sometimes they don't want you parking in the driveway or there's a lot of cars or there's no parking in the driveway. View parking and that will help decrease a lot of your anxiety as well. What do we do after we set up our visit? You drive to the visit. I'm not going to review specific charting um, because I use a different charting system. My sister, Mister, over here uses a char different charting system. Another sister reviews another charting system. I'm going to review specifics when it comes to that. What I do when I'm in my car, I will open up my nursing note. That saves you time in the home. Since I do a lot of focused visits, I will, my charting system has boxes that we check off. So say I'm going for no bowel movement for like seven days. I'm going to always check off my main, um, <clears throat> my main systems like cardiovascular, respiratory, always, always check those guys. Um, and of course I'm going to click GI. I want you guys to be clicking GI <laughs> at every visit anyway, um, because that's a huge big deal. Unless there's no reason to be concerned. Say you went there yesterday and you know they had a bowel movement yesterday. If you're a case manager, you want to be checking the bowels at every visit. <laughs> but as a PRN nurse on the weekends, yep, I check the bowels of every patient, even if that's not my main concern. I check off all my systems that I'm going to be reviewing with my patient um, and go in. Okay, so I had to take the headphones off, so I apologize. Now, during COVID times, obviously, it's a lot different. Um, I'm going to be getting PPE in my car. I'm going to be getting all dressed. Where would I would wear something similar to what I'm wearing right now. No thick jackets underneath it. Obviously, it's not going to be very comfortable. So keep in mind, um, if you're going to home health and hospice that, and you're in a colder area, just be prepared. <laughs> you're going to be cold. Donning and doffing PPE when it's like snowing out. Because right now we're going into pretty much every home in full PPE. I'm going to take my checks. And yeah, there could be animals in the house. So be prepared for that. <laughs> You go into the home, you're going to introduce yourself to everybody. I'm going to be doing your assessment today or your visit. It's very nice to meet you. Introduce yourself. I take my checks. I put it down wherever I can. <laughs> that might also happen. So I want you guys to keep in mind that when you're in ho homes, um, you're not going to always have a clean bedside table to put your stuff down on, okay? So that's why sometimes if my patient has a big bed or if there's a clearing at the end of the bed, I will put my stuff on there. But just keep in mind before you put your stuff down, 
will I have to move it? So if you're going to be doing wound care, uh, find a different spot than the bed because you might have to move your patient. Then you're going to have to move your stuff and then it becomes this big to do. You're not supposed to be touching because this is supposed to be your clean area. Your chucks is supposed to be your clean area. So if you're constantly picking and up and moving it, it's not clean anymore. Now this isn't a standard chuck. This is actually a doggy pee pee pad. Sometimes I have these in my own car just to put on my seats or um, for other purposes just in case I run out. You just never know. I've I'm gonna put my computer on one side as well. So I consider my bag the dirty side, and my computer is gonna be the clean side. That's just the way I roll because you have limited space. I'm not gonna put two chucks and my laptop is huge. Okay, so after you get your setup all done, so what I like to do now, since it's COVID times, I will open my bag before I go in. So that way I have less zippers to touch when I'm in there as well. Make sure everything is accessible to you, um, that you're not gonna be fumbling. It is hard and things happen. Um, you know, like getting alcohol swabs to clean stuff, like that can be an issue sometimes. I still have the habit of putting them in my pockets. Maybe I was in a facility, I might feel more comfortable with that, but we're in people's homes. So set up PP, set up your, your checks to put your stuff down on. Now, this is a state requirement in my state. I'm pretty sure most home health and hospice agencies um, nationwide in the United States have to do this. Um, it is to prevent cross-contamination, not because I'm a germaphobe. And I know not every nurse does this, but I do. And I think it's a great thing to get in practice um, and used to if you're just coming into home health and hospice. Okay? So I'm going to bring... Yes, kitty witty. <laughs> kitty witty. No, no. Kitty. Say hi. The ear. How did you just lock that? Head to toe. Obviously, you're going to do your. Obviously, before you do your full head to toe, you're going to do your addressing them, ask them if they have any questions, concerns, anything they should know about that maybe wasn't addressed in your phone call. Those things will come up. You're going to tell them what you're doing before you do it, even in our Alzheimer's dementia patients. If they're Alzheimer's dementia people, you're going to have to. What do you have there? You have to kind of figure out and kind of roll with it because you're not always going to be able to explain to them exactly what you're doing, but it's good to at least try and do it in a mannerism that's not going to, you know, cause them any sort of anxiety. Hard to do, but you'll figure it out. You have not done this yet, or if your agency hasn't offered it, um, maybe bring up taking some online courses from Tipa Snow. She is great with Alzheimer's and dementia. A lot of great um, techniques on how to approach them, side approach, things like that. Um, okay, we're going to go from obviously head to toe. So you're going to check up here, you're going to check here, you're going to check the lungs, heart. Always assess for edema, pain. Pain's a big one. And breathing is a big one, especially in hospice, okay? So do your full head to toe assessment. And after that, I always like to take vital signs, of course, during the head to toe. And that is going to be before you do wound care, um, peri care, any of that, because you don't want those vital signs to be any sort of misconstrued by activity because they can, they can and will increase when you like, say you roll a patient over to do a wound. <laughs> A wound care wound care on the bottom so let's say I'm doing wound care right but I might bring an extra chucks in if I'm doing wound care so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set up don't mind the um, Paw Patrol pillow this is real life um, I'm gonna set up my wound care stuff here and set up your wound care stuff before you get the patient ready that way because you only have one shot sometimes if you're turning them to do that dressing on the back Especially with our Alzheimer's dementia patients, you don't want to put them through more than they need to. Set up your wound care staff and whatnot. And so something to keep in mind also, I say that a lot, something to keep in mind. Um, think about where you're at when you do wound care. So are you at an assisted living? <laughs> How hard is it to get an aide to help you to reposition a patient when you're in, in and assisted? Pretty hard. There's not a lot of them. Sometimes there's one to two for the whole entire building. So before you call them in to help you, make sure you're ready. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll just say, you know what, I'll press the call pendant when I'm ready for you guys to do the wound care. So set up everything, make sure your assessment is done. 
Um, and make sure you have any questions you need for them ready at that time as well. Like if you can ask for when the last bowel movement was, they don't have to keep track of them in an assisted. I know some do. Um, so yeah, so do your wound care, um, wound care suppositories. Yes. All those things should be addressed after you get your vital signs, after you have spoken with the patient and the family, um, and addressed issues just because you want to just do the less stressful things first so that everybody is calm, cool, and collected, <laughs> especially for vital signs. Now we're going to do three things that you're going to want to address at every visit. That's poop, pain, and pills. Not necessarily in that order. Poop. Like I said, please check bowel movements, bowel status every visit. When did they poop? Have they been on their bowel regimen? Any other issues that are concerning? Specifically, what's the texture of said poop? Is it liquidy? Is it peanut butter consistency? Is it hard? Let's address all of those issues, please, so that we don't run into patients who haven't had a bowel movement in 10 days, and I'm gonna go see them on a Saturday because of it. It happens, I don't mind. But imagine being that patient not having pooped in 10 days. And for those of you wondering, well, if they're at end of life and they haven't eaten, why does it matter if they haven't pooped? Because at end of life, people still are producing um, stool in their GI tract. Might not. Yes. Pain. Of course, as a hospice nurse, you're going to check pain. That's one of our biggest things. Comfort care, right? Pain level, pain pills. Have they been taking them? How often have they been taking their PRNs? Is there any new PRNs added? Sometimes if you have a patient in an ALF or at home, family or the patient may add a pain medication in there, such as Motrin and Tylenol that maybe the patient wasn't taking before. So always double check. And pills. Do they need refills? Anything else we should add to the med list? Anything else that maybe we should take off of the med list? All good things to be addressed, all good things. Now, if you're in a facility, such as an ALF or a skilled nursing facility, uh, check the chart. Always check the chart. Check the chart. What are you doing? She's chewing on my notebook, y'all. Because you want to check to see if there's maybe any new nursing notes, any physician notes, or any new orders, or labs even. Sometimes they might get a um, UTI on there. Um, so they might be having a, a UA that you might need to check. Hold on, I got, or maybe they had a KUB. I've had those done on my patients and I didn't even realize it until I checked the charts that they had a KUB the other day. Cause sometimes, hey, those nurses are busy. They should be updating us. We should know, but sometimes things happen. So double check the chart. And if you have any questions, always ask the nurse. Speaking of nurses and nursing facilities, can you be quiet? I'm trying to film. There's no building zoom. So speaking of nurses in nursing facilities, always what I like to do when I go into an ALF or a skilled nursing facility is go find the nurse first. A, you want to make your presence known in the facility other than the front desk personnel, front desk personnel. You don't want to be the stranger nurse wandering around the facility. So go find the nurse and ask if there's any questions or concerns, problems that they have before they, before you head in. It may give you some insight to things. That way you're not playing catch up or trying to find somebody to ask, hey, what is this? Hey, what is that? Is it anything? And if they're a nurse who is an agency nurse or they work per diem, so they don't know the patient, because that happens a lot. Always ask, is there anything that happened this shift that I should know about? Because they might not know what happened to that patient last week. And then there are some nurses who know the patients like the back of their hand who have been working at the facility for a long time. So they will have concerns or questions for you. I love those nurses. Yes. So always go find the nurse before your visit. And if she's unavailable or if it's taking too much time, then yes. Go to the visit first and then you can always play catch up after. Because you can only spend so much time waiting for people. And if there is any questions or concerns that you feel like you did not address in your visit that you can't answer for the um, facility nurse, you can always go back or figure it out. Just keep in mind also on your head to toe as well. Don't forget to check skin integrity, especially if you're having a bed bound patient. 
other things that might be included on your nursing assessment. Um, let's say you're doing a casual visit. I like to include nutrition because um, that shows a lot of how our patient is trending. Are they eating? Is their diet downgraded? Do they need a downgraded diet? Also, you may be able to catch up on kind of what are their favorite foods nowadays. What is something that they really like to eat? That's good to know. Yes, so the last pee pills, refills, things like that. Call pharmacy, make sure, especially if you're heading into the weekend that your patients have enough to get them by. If they're coming close to the end, call pharmacy, get some refills. Call the doctor if you need another script for a um, narc or something like that. Just get it all done. Don't wait to the last minute because you just never know. Things can get pushed back. Visits can get pushed back. So you don't want your patient to be um, left out in the cold. Make sure they're well off. The last thing that I address in my visit is education with the patient, with the family, and with the facility nurses. Okay, so I always start with who's in the room first and then I go from there. The other things they're gonna review is new medications. Um, you're gonna go over your assessment thoughts um, if you made a call to the physician. So a lot of the times when we're in a visit, we're not going to hear back from the physician. So we're going to have to call them back later and just make sure the family knows that they'll be getting a call from you later so that they can pick up the phone um, and always review who the contact is you're going to call. Because some um, patients do have a list of family members, um, but they do have a primary one, but that's not always going to be who you're gonna be contacting that day. Because Bob could be the primary healthcare proxy, but he might not be the one taking care of mom that day. It could be Sue. So you're gonna to wanna to call probably Sue. And then you can also call Bob just to update him. Uh, it's a lot of paperwork, it is. And it's a lot of calling people and then charting about calling people. <laughs> so yes, education also can be to um, facility staff on make sure you're always reviewing things like they know to reposition the patient Q2H while they're in bed. Review if you have any, see any spots on their skin that are of concern at all, of course. Document conversations that you have with the staff um, just so you know and you have a paper trail of the fact that you reviewed all of these things with them. Um, and you're also going to want to, of course, put somewhere in your note that you reviewed the visit with the facility staff nurse and that they have no new questions or if they have questions of course you're going to want to um, go over those in your note as well and show how you address those concerns so yes again it's a lot of charting can be a pain in the butt but it's a necessary evil and it's to cover your butt cya you got to cover your butt and that helps the you know that really does make it better for the patient as well if you're making sure you're covering every single one of your bases before you get out of there. You don't want there to be any questions or concerns at all. Something to keep in mind before you leave the facility if you're at an ALF um, and you're ordering medications, what time do the nurses leave? And if the medications are for the patient's lockbox, make sure that there's a family member there to receive them. A lot of the times we'll mail them to the family's house instead of the facility because the facilities cannot accept these medications. So just make sure everyone knows if there's meds being delivered, where the meds are being delivered to, what kind of meds they are, when to use them, how to use them, etc. Education. What do you do if you're at a facility and the family's not there? Yep, you're going to call to update. And yes, again, more charting. Um, if they don't answer, leave a voicemail. You have to chart that you left a voicemail. Hopefully they'll call back. And you can review what happened at the visit and then you have to chart that as well. What stinks about that is, you know, Murphy's Law. Murphy's Law usually happens. So they're going to ask a question about something that maybe you didn't touch base on. Like, did you talk to the nurse about um, ordering, you know, s protective jerry sleeves? I didn't say, nope, I didn't. Like, if you didn't see any skin tears, uh, the nurse didn't bring up any concerns regarding skin tears or the need for jerry sleeves. How are you supposed to know if you didn't see it in the chart either? It may be something that the family and the facility staff nurse discussed amongst themselves and never brought up to hospice. So don't worry about it. It can be addressed another day. They can go ahead and order the jerry sleeves. We'll figure it out and we'll put it in our chart when we see the patient with the jerry sleeves on. 
right? Because you're not going to chart something that's not there yet either. So now let's say visit's all done. We're going to do after our visit is leave. Leave. Yeah, we're going to leave. Doff our PPE. Probably go finish the note in the car because there's no way that most of us, I know you, I know we're supposed to finish our notes in the visit, but the narrative note sometimes requires a lot of concentration because we write sometimes paragraphs, legit novels, because sometimes those check boxes aren't specific enough. And then if you're a weekend nurse or a PRN nurse, you are going to have to send an email to your care team updating them about the patient. I feel bad that they have to wake up to that email on Monday morning. I really do. And I know they don't even wait till Monday morning. I know they're checking my email Sunday night and you guys shouldn't do it. Okay. I know it's hard not to start your work week on a Sunday, but you deserve more Sunday. You deserve a whole Sunday off. Okay. So what I do is, cause some of you might not have that many case managers. We have a lot. I hit, so if I work Saturdays and Sundays, I'm going to have a bunch of draft emails going on. Okay, so after each visit, just so I get it over with and I don't have to do it at the end of my visit, at the end of my day, because at the end of my day, I just want to leave. Okay, so I will draft an email to, let's say, Cheyenne and clinical manager Sue. And I'll type in patient update in my title with the date. The two days, Saturday and Sunday, or 11, let's say 1, 2, and 1, 3. All of the emails, for those who are watching who are not um, working in home health or hospice, our emails are encrypted. So we're allowed to use um, uh, patient info in there. But if you are worried about it, um, you can always just use initials. Usually the case manager knows their patients enough. Um, and unless you have people with the same name. Be careful. Put in your patient's name and what you saw them for, what you did. It's basically a soap note. So you're going to do that for each of them. And I just, I hit, I make a bunch of drafts. So that way I just add my patients as I go to whatever clinical manager's email I need to. And then I hit send when I'm all done my day or all done my weekend, I should say. So that way I don't have to send them one email for Saturday, one email for Sunday. They all get sent in one email so they don't get like lost amongst the jumble because you know when you open up your emails Monday morning it's a whole smorgasbord of things from every single person so update your care team and if you are not a if you're a weak person if you're a case manager and there's something you need someone to know for say the evening or overnight also send an email to that that team whether it be the on-call nurse or the whole clinical staff or however big your agency is so that's pretty much how I run my visit as a hospice nurse. Um, I, like I said, I do mostly focus visits, but even if I have a focus visit, I'm still doing a whole head to toe because you never know. There could be something you're going to miss that could be causing the issue that you're there for, and you don't want to miss it. That's not cool. Um, a couple things that I didn't go over are like cleaning equipment and boring stuff like that. Cause I don't need to, you know, we all have to clean it, especially now that we're going to COVID land every single day. Good stuff. If you guys, if I didn't touch base on something else, let me know. I feel like there was really a lot that I missed. I really wish I had a patient, but I mean, they wouldn't make it really that much of a difference anyway. So I hope this video was helpful. Thank you for subscribing. I finally hit over a thousand subscribers, um, but it's only thanks to you guys. And thank you so much for watching. And I really appreciate it. I'm so happy that I get to keep doing this. Um, I just need to think of more video ideas. I do have a bunch more videos, a bunch more. Is that English? Is that proper? I'm waiting in the wings as well, but I really wanted to put this one out there because yes. And also if you guys are not already, follow me on Instagram. I'm gonna put it right here. I have a smorgasbord on my Instagram, so bear with me, but um, that's where I'm gonna put if I have any new videos coming out. Because I know nobody's going to put on post notifications. Um, and if you do, thank you. Also, my new kitty has an Instagram as well. I will put that right here. Right here. She's super cute. Thank you guys so much for watching. Put any questions, comments, concerns down below. And yeah, enjoy the day.